last talk this morning, prior to lunch, is from contribution from American National Petroleum. This talk is to be given by Howard Moore on FCC catalyst testing. Howard is the manager of the process section in the research application and development department of Marathon National. He got his uh, master's and bachelor's degree at the University of Kentucky in chemical engineering. Um, while his time, his time at National, he developed and implemented uh, Ashley's first pilot with FCC units. He's also supervised proprietary research in coal and oil shale refining, and also been responsible for laboratory and pilot scale process research and development, including evaluation of many types of systems. Thank you, Steve. I guess the first two talks today hopefully will lead a little bit into uh, uh, what I like to talk about. Except I, I'm going to change directions with you a little bit. I see Ed and Ross's talks as being very specific, mechanistic types of, uh, of, uh, of research, trying to understand the details of what's happening. Uh, we definitely need that. We need to do those types of evaluations to improve what we're going to do. What I'm going to try to talk to you about this morning is from exactly the other direction. Instead of from the details of what's happening at the catalytic site, I'm going to try to talk to you a little bit about how you, how you uh, should select FCC catalysts, how we look at them globally in terms of how they, they will operate in the unit, or at least how we can predict that they will operate in, uh, in our commercial cracking units. Uh, from my standpoint, over the course of my 23-year career in refining, uh, the cat cracker has always been, to me, the most important unit in the refinery. Basically, it takes a material, a, a, a heavy petroleum material, which has very little use otherwise, and turns it into the motor fuels that hopefully brought all of us here to the, uh, to the symposium today. Um, the, other, the other piece of what I'm going to talk about is, is pretty much a summary of what we've learned over the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, some of these slides are old, some of them are going to be a little hard to read. This, this slide actually derives from when we started this particular program that I'm going to tell you about. And that slide derives from about 15 years ago. If you look at the cost of catalysts to the refinery, the biggest cost is their FCC catalyst. And if you look at the, the, the present Marathon Ashland LLC operations, running about seven, uh, seven cat crackers. We're going to spend somewhere around $30 million a year on FCC catalysts. So it's kind of important to us that the catalysts that we buy uh, aren't too expensive, but yet perform well. Why should they perform well? If we lose 1% gasoline yield from gasoline into residual material or material similar to the feed that we started out with, that's going to cost us about a million dollars a year. So not only do we have to control our costs in terms of what we're buying, but we have to have the yields and the yield selectivity that hopefully we can make a little bit of profit, sell you a product that's, that's good and, uh, and, and representative of, of what, we, uh, what you would like to have. Um, the third major bullet down, I think, is the key point that I want to emphasize on this slide. Uh, at the time we got into this program, there were basically three ways of testing catalysts. Basically, there's still three ways of testing catalysts, in my opinion, although there are some derivatives. One, there's a MAT test, microactivity test, little teeny tiny glassware in a furnace. Most of the work that you're going to see is done in mats for a very good reason. It's cheap. It's, you can do it rapidly. You can focus on the particular yields that you're interested in. It's a very good tool for those sorts of things. Another way of, of testing is in pilot plants. Pilot plants are larger, they cost a lot more to do, but you can simulate what happens a lot more in a pilot plant than you can in a map. There's lots of different things that happen uh, in the cat cracker that you need to simulate over and beyond just the innate activity of the catalyst itself. We put dirty feeds in there. There's lots of metals that deposit on these catalysts. We put catalyst in every day, so you've got an age distribution in an FCC unit that you have to have some way to simulate. We get uh, upsets in our units. 
we may steam, as Ed was doing, uh, a, a catalyst five times more than we normally would in one period of time. So we have to know uh, and be able to simulate those sorts of things as well. The problems we had with the microactivity test at the time, and we think uh, uh, still apply to that test, is that it does not do a real good job of predicting what we call bottoms cracking. In other words, the heavy molecules that don't fit into the zeolite cage. And you've heard that comment a couple of times this morning. It also has a problem with coat selectivity when we start building matrices into these catalysts. When we start mixing both the zeolite and amorphous types of, of, of activity in these catalysts, the mat can, can give you numbers which maybe aren't uh, fully representative of what you want to see. Uh, pilot plant generally can handle most of those things, but again, it can be expensive. The biggest problem in pilot plants is how do you prepare catalyst in large enough scale to, to test it, which really represents what's going on in your commercial FCC unit as well. Finally, you can test commercially, uh, but believe it or not, sometimes commercial data is the hardest data there is to get in FCC units. We've got a unit we call a reduced crude conversion unit at Catsburg, and every dog and cat known to man goes in that unit. The crudes change every day. The catalyst mix may change every day. So trying to get real numbers off that kind of unit uh, is much more difficult sometimes than going back in the lab and getting it itself. The other problem with testing on a commercial scale is go back to my 1% loss of gasoline yield that costs you a million dollars a year. In 30 days or so, and it takes 30 to 60 days to change a, uh, change a catalyst out and start seeing catalyst effects in, in, in a cat cracker. In 30 to 60 days, you've lost a lot of money in a commercial unit if you pick the wrong catalyst to start with. You can do a lot of catalyst testing with a million dollars worth of, of, of funding. So that's what, we, uh, that's what we looked at when we first started this program. And, and just kind of to, to highlight that, uh, let me go through a little exercise here that uh, hopefully will demonstrate what I'm trying to say. And I won't, I won't read this, don't like to read slides, I like to walk around and talk with the audience. Uh, but basically, we tested this particular catalyst in all three modes, in the mat unit, oh, excuse me, in, in the mat unit, in an intermediate mode, which we call a fixed fluidized bed type of testing, which is kind of like a mat, only it's larger, and the catalyst is fluidized. One of the problems with the mat, the catalyst isn't fluidized, and you can have heat effects, okay? And then thirdly, we tested this catalyst in, in, in our circulating pilot units. <coughs> And the, the, the point I want to make here is that how you test catalysts can really impact the results that you get. Uh, the other thing to note is we always test new catalysts against catalysts whose performance that we know. Because cat crackers can be very, uh, uh, very different in what they do, so that you, you need the reference tie back to the commercial unit. Basically, our reference here is a catalyst that we know performs well for us. And in this case, in the MAT test, the candidate looked reasonably good. It was more active. If you notice, the conversion was higher. Uh, gasoline was up. Coke was comparable or better than the other catalyst. Looked really good. When we, looked, when we went to a little larger scale, the catalyst didn't look nearly as good. All of a sudden, our coke is, is, is higher. The material is still more active in this particular test, but now gasoline is down, and the overall yield structure is poor. Again, these are on metallated catalysts. We, we, we tend to test in real-world situations with metals and those sorts of things, and I'll comment on that in a minute. So now we're saying, well, wait a minute. Is this catalyst really what we want to use at all? We went to the pilot plant and the catalyst failed totally. The message I want to give you from that, rather than trying to sell you on a particular testing form, <coughs> is you have to be very careful how you test and how you interpret the numbers that you get. If we had gone commercial with that material based on that original MAT test, we would have lost a lot of money in our FCC. Basically what you have to look at for <coughs> testing program 
and in this case, obviously, the SEC program. Some of these things may seem to be obvious to you, but, but when I come back to them, hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll give you some reasoning for why I put, the, put them up there. Uh, basically, you have to be correlatable to commercial operations. Many times in testing programs, what you obtain in your test is not what you're going to get in the commercial unit. It's not in the mat, frequently not in the pilot plants. So you have to be able to correlate to what's going to happen commercially. Secondly, you have to utilize virgin cattle samples, and I'll comment on that in a minute. We feel being a resid processor, we put a lot of metals in our cat crackers, that you have to process realistic metals levels. We don't think a catalyst tested at zero metals is going to perform in a unit running 8,000 parts per million metals the same as it would at zero. So we, we, we always use realistic metals. We think you have to charge actual feedstocks. I'll show you some data where the same catalyst under the same conditions respond differently to different feedstocks. Uh, and the two things that drive us almost all the time now are, 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 are cost issues. First of all, you have to minimize the probability of the commercial failure. We don't want to lose that million dollars a year in yield structure advantage. And finally, as we all know, we have to minimize total testing. Nobody's out there saying take all the money you want and test everything you want. There's always the competition for the search dollar. What I'm going to do, I'm going to come backwards up that list and try to make just a few comments. And by the way, we will be at lunch on time or earlier. That's, uh, I think that's why Pat put me before lunch. Uh, I tend to get hungry. No. Uh, from all that, I'm not going to go through the details or anything. I'm just going to back up that list uh, 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 just conversationally in a minute. We came up with a three-phase program, and that's how basically we minimize our cost. First of all, we go through phase one, which is characterization, physical properties, specialty tests, whether it be matrix or carbon oxidations or things we've learned that are important in, in, in special units at, uh, at our refineries. That's a fairly cheap level to go through, and we also ask the vendors to give us that data, so we don't have to do it a lot. So we'll minimize costs there. If we don't like any of the data there, the catalyst doesn't go any further. If we do like the numbers off of phase one, we'll go to what we call phase two. That's a fixed fluidized bed test. It's a little larger than the mat, it gives you a little more data, it correlates a little better with commercial operations. Only after that will we go to full pilot scale testing. And keep in mind that a full pilot scale test might cost you as much as $75,000 to do a test. So these kinds of things can be very expensive. You don't want to go to the pilot plant without full assurance that it's going to win. In fact, you don't ever want to lose at the pilot plant if you're really good at this. <coughs> You can also minimize program costs, and we do this. We limit the cattle submissions. We don't want the vendors coming in and saying every week, here's a new catalyst. We want them to know what our needs are. We want them to take that knowledge, develop catalysts which they think will work well for us, and then only come in with those infrequently. Um, we might argue about this, but there's not a lot of new catalysts coming on the market every month. We're lucky if there's one truly new one every year or so. So you don't need to do a huge amount of detailed testing on these materials. Another, another thing that has worked well for us is testing classes of applications. In other words, we have four or five cat crackers who have similar types of operations, so we'll test in general for them rather than doing specific tests for each one. And to take that one step further, we'll limit those refinery-specific tests only to particular needs if we have them. We talked about feedstocks, and I'm just going to throw these on here real quickly. I don't expect you to read them, but I, I just want to highlight three feeds here. Um, this is a really sweet material. It uh, has no material that we call vacuum bottoms in it. It's got a 27 API gravity. 
and a rams bottom carbon of about 0.1. I doubt that many of you that would mean much too, but, but just, uh, just kind of remember those numbers for a minute. And if you look at the metals levels, essentially no metals in that feed. When we start heaving up our feeds, the API gravity comes down, means it's more dense. The rams bottom carbon, which is basically um, um, aromatics or, or materials which will polycondense and will not vaporize in a, in a, in a, a pyrolysis type test is up now up to 0.8. Those materials generally go to coke and uh, metals are still pretty clean. And then when we go to resid feeds, gravity now is all the way down to 16. Ram's bottom carbon is on the order of 8 metals are 60 or 70 or 8. So that's the range of feeds we use. And here's what happens when you use them on different catalysts. Uh, these shy lines, the red curves are a reference catalysts which we know perform well for us. The blue curves are pure gas oil catalysts which don't perform well for us normally. And the green is the catalyst that we're testing. On this real sweet feed, the first slide I showed you, this performed very well. Basically, that's comparable gasoline yield. And the other thing we always look at is bottoms conversion or life cycle oil. The higher the life cycle oil number, the more residual material has been converted. So that red and that green curve are pretty common. But if we use exactly the same catalyst, on a heavier feed, now we start to see very significant differences. Again, the green line is the catalyst we're testing. Performance now is down at least a percent, maybe a percent and a half lower on gasoline yield, whereas before on a clean feed it was, it was comparable. And even bottom scratching performance has degraded. So the message I want to leave with you here is that your particular catalyst has to be designed for and tested for the catalyst that you want to use it on in the, in the types of uh, modes of operation that you plan. Since we put resin in our feeds, we say you need to test catalyst at realistic metals levels. We historically run in the 3,000 ppm nickel plus vanadium range with the RCC at Catalystburg running in 8,000. Region. We're trying to integrate marathon units in our thinking now, and we're even raising our own new questions. All right. and, and I'll pretty much pose this to the other FCC people in the area, or else you, you, you in particular. Uh, we'd be interested to know at some point, and we're going to have to decide, uh, what metals level is performance simulated without metals metallation at all? In other words, uh, can we go ahead and just test with steaming? rather than going ahead and having to add metals as well. Uh, it's a question I don't know the answer to right now. Hopefully at some point we will. What are the major effects of metals? Basically metals catalyze non-desired reactions. And what you see, the dotted line is at 8,000 ppm metals levels on catalyst. And the solid line is exactly the same catalyst at 3,000 ppm metals on catalyst. So what you see is catalyzing non-desired dehydrogenation reactions, which not only show up in terms of hydrogen, which really doesn't hurt you that much in itself, except on compressor limitations, but you also see at the same time when you see elevated hydrogen yields, you always see elevated code as well, or almost always. There's a case or two that does not occur. In terms of metals effects, higher hydrogen always means higher coke. You don't want coke. Coke is not a liquid product. We sell liquids. We want liquid product. So that's the effect of metals. We feel like you always have to test and include them in your testing program. This seems like a really stupid statement. Testing requires virgin catalyst samples. 
but believe it or not, it's probably the hardest thing that we have to deal with. Again, I commented that you add catalyst to a cat cracker every day. So you have an age distribution on an equilibrium inventory that you have to simulate. You have different feeds, you have different metals. Basically what you can't get, except either out of the unit itself or make it yourself, is an equilibrium catalyst inventory <coughs> that represents what you're trying to test it for. And making that what we call pseudo-equilibrium catalyst is probably the hardest job that you have to do. Ed was making a pseudo-equilibrium catalyst for a low metals situation when he steamed. Basically, hydrothermal deactivation is the major deactivation mechanism without metals. But in addition to that, if you're going to test it for your refinery use for catalyst qualification, you have to impose an age distribution, and if you have metals, you have to throw the metals in as well. So it gets very complicated. Uh, some work that uh, Jim Palmer, who's in the back of the room, did with uh, Ted Cornelia several years ago uh, demonstrates this, uh, this very well. Let me make sure I have the right one. Basically, what this shows is that there is, a, there is an age distribution of nickel and vanadium as well across the entire equilibrium inventory in an FCC unit. What this is is a sample of commercial FCC ECAT, which has been gradient density active uh, uh, separated and measured for these elements. This density curve basically represents age in the unit. So as the catalyst ages in the unit, it collects more and more catalyst, becomes more and more deactivated. And what you end up wanting to do is test that entire spectrum rather than one single metals level. Finally, your test results should be correlatable to commercial operations. I, I, again, that may seem to be obvious to some people, but many people in the industry have not done that. They've basically gone in, measured three different sets of, of responses for three different catalysts and said this is the best one without taking the further step and saying this is what it means commercially. Basically what we feel you have to do is you have to measure, and this is a lousy slide, you have to measure your performance win. Okay? This is our baseline curves of our pilot plant testing. The blue is the bad catalyst or the lower performer. The red is the better performer. And that's the difference that you have to work with to measure. In other words, if one measures 5% and the other measures 7%, and you get another number that's 5.5, .5, is it significant or not? You have to know what your measurement window is. A lot of people miss that. You also have to know realistically and look at your gasoline deal, can you tell a difference between two different catalysts? That's why we take these catalysts, we know one is very good in the commercial unit, one is not, and we prove to ourselves, yes, we can measure the key differences between those catalysts. Secondly, which was the title of the slide, you have to truly correlate what you measure experimentally to the commercial unit. These are data where we went to the commercial unit, pulled feedstock and catalyst in the same day, brought them back into the laboratory, tested them in the, in the laboratory, and then plotted experimental result versus the commercial result. And in those cases where we found the numbers to not agree or not be in directional agreement, they won't agree 100% ever, uh, we went back and found out what was wrong with their test. And then finally, under that heading, once you finally recommend the catalyst, you have to go back and post audit. Was your prediction right or was your prediction wrong? And that's when your stomach gets kind of tight and you get, kind of have butterflies when you work up the data, particularly the first time you do it. Uh, what these are are comparison of our commercial data in the middle with the 
what I'm calling phase three or pilot plant data on the right, um, and there, there are differences versus a reference catalyst. Again, the absolute yields in these tests don't always tell you anything. What you need are the, are the differentials. These numbers are particularly good. It's probably why I chose to show you the slide. Uh, but if you look at Coke, Coke's in, in perfect agreement. Cycle oil, which is uh, the measure of bottom scrapping, is great. Gasoline looks good. The differences, the uncertainties are up here in the gases, and we feel most of those are because they had gas measurement problems in the plant rather than even uh, uh, our data. But the message I want to give you from it is once you predict something, predict it ahead of time. And then after it's used, go back and post all of it. Uh, absolutely critical. Many people don't like to do that because you can prove yourself wrong. And to conclude, this is from another presentation where the first two bullets are, are, are hopefully representative of what I've told you. Uh, first of all, over a period of about 15 years, we've developed, implemented, and used, and hopefully made a lot of money from a testing procedure which was pretty rigorous. It's uh, fairly well recognized in the industry as being one of the toughest to, to qualify a catalyst into, and, uh, and we think we've done real well with it. And secondly, the key I would leave you with is the real meat of the whole problem is A, making a catalyst which looks like what it's going to look like actually in the plant and operating whatever testing unit you use. And there's many different ways to do it, there's many different units. But operating those testing units in a manner which you can then correlate to what you're going to see commercially. So with that, I'll close. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, yes, um, I guess I'm. I guess I'm trying, struggling exactly with, with, with what to tell you at that point. Um, we've actually gone back into our data sets, our databases, and correlated properties with performance. We actually have uh, predictive models based on the virgin catalyst properties as to what we think it will do in our commercial units. Uh, the reason I can't give you a direct answer is it varies depending on the unit. For instance, with our RCC unit, uh, bottom scrapping, metals tolerance, and those sorts of things are much more important. Uh, in our FCC units, which process cleaner feeds, uh, activities, uh, surface areas, zeolite content, and those things are much more important. But, but, but basically what we found is needed in a dirty environment, if I can use that term, where we put metals and, and, and high coke levels and that sort of thing. We generally like lower surface areas, lower zeolite contents, much higher matrix contents. Uh, we like to have big feeder pores, which can get the big molecules in to where the catalytic sites are. Uh, we need uh, metal stability. Pat, help me if you can think of any, any more of them. Um, those sorts of parameters when you've got a dirty feed. When you go to a clean feed, zeolite, zeolite unit cell size, uh, rare earth is important to both of them. Um, it's, it's, it's just, a, it's just a, a difference between what feed you're using and, and, and what the objective is for your unit. For instance, if you want octane, uh, you know, rare earth is going to be absolutely critical to, to, to your octane balance. I understand that the auto industry would like to have the, uh, sodium, the sulfur level in motor fuels reduced by maybe an order of magnitude. What implications does that have for, for you? Uh, not real good. Uh, again, the major contributor of sulfur to the uh, or uh, of sulfur to the gasoline pool is Cat Cracker, uh, where we make most of our money. So uh, one of the studies we're going through right now is what we have to do to get the sulfur levels down to where we expect them to be. Uh, we expect them to be probably in the 100 to 150 ppm sulfur range versus probably four to 500 average now. So you think it will come down? 
We know it will come. The only question to us right now is how low is it going to be? Do you feel that refineries are going to do more and more hydro treating as we go along? The feeds are going to be more hydro treated because, as you said, testing is going to be hydro treated feed tests tests very differently than non hydro treated. Feed. Right. Right. Uh, again, I, again, I, I've, I've got a complex answer to a simple question. Uh, I've been pushing hydro treating for FCC feedstocks for five or six years now. It's, it's, it's definitely the way to go technically. It gives you superior yields. It helps your products. It lowers the sulfur. It does all the good thing. The problem is we can't afford it. Um, to put a new FCC hydro treater in in a typical refinery is probably going to cost $250 million and we'll get no return on that investment. Zero. Uh, but isn't it possible if over the long run, with the hydro-treated feed, you may end up getting more gasoline yield. You definitely get more gasoline. And that might, for but a period of time... It, it, the, the, the upgrade generally is somewhere between, say, a dollar a, a, a barrel. Mm -hmm. That's the economic return. Uh, you, you can't pay up to $150 million. Howard, I have the feeling that if, if you're hydro-treating feed, your benefit really comes from putting hydrogen in sulfur out. Is, is that consistent? Yes, yes. Well, it's, it's all three statements are consistent. We take some sulfur out so the gasoline has lower sulfur in it. Yeah. But as, as, as Ross also said, the, the product slate is improved. You make more gasoline by putting the hydrogen in. Generally, generally gasoline yield is a direct correlator, uh, directly correlated by hydrogen. I mean, hydrogen goes up, gasoline goes up. That, that's exactly right. Again, the problem though, we're only going to get a dollar a barrel or so value out of that, and uh, it's, it's just not enough pay for the investment. So the answer is higher gasoline price. <laughs> uh, right, right. Uh, I like the way you think, Pat. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank